Well, a few announcements today. Again, no, re no refuel again this Wednesday, and there will not be refuel the following Wednesday either, so just keep that on your calendar. This Friday from 5 to 7, Sanctuary will be open for, uh, we call it family communion, it can be group communion, whatever you want it to be, whoever you consider to be family, bring them along, and it's just going to be a time, I'll have the altars out, it's just time for you to come forward and just pray, let me pray with you and pray for you and receive God's grace on that Good Friday to remember, be reminded on that day what Christ did for us. So join, just come anytime between 5 and 7. I'll be here. Um, and if you need to come earlier because you, you need to and you can't come during that time, let me know. I'll, I'll be here. And we'll do that then. But this Friday. Third Saturday is, is not this Saturday, the next one, right? Not the next one, the next one. Anyway, family movie night. Join us on that one, 5 to 8, and invite your friends. Be the Light is right around the corner. That is not next Sunday. Next Sunday is Easter. It begins the 16th, the Sunday right after Easter. And it'll be six Sundays, five weeks of intentionally loving the people around us. So shirts are due in, <clears throat> I, think, I think, this Friday. So we'll have all those shirts in. Your kids are, all the kids are making their own shirts today. They got the Be the Light logo on them. They're going to be twisting them up and putting some tie-dye in there. It's a really cool It'll be a fun right after church today. It won't take very long, I don't think. And hopefully they get paint all over them and take it to your car. <laughs> what better way? Celebrate. Anyway, that, that's coming up. Be thinking about how you're going to love the people around you over the next five, six weeks. And we'll have some helps for you in the meantime. BBS is right around the corner. We're almost there with our goal, by the way. Just, just the, like $30 short, maybe 70 $70 short of the $2,000 that we needed to raise to, to make sure VBS happens. So if you've not, um, or if God's leading you to, to, to give towards that, make that happen this year. Let's, let's meet that goal. But we've got a training workshop. There's a sign-up sheet on the connection point table in the back. So if you want to help, you don't want to get like locked down and deleting something, but you just want to be available to help, you can just sign up back there at that table and just Caitlin will get a hold of you and plug you in during that week, but uh, really looking forward to VBS training days on the 29th. That's a Saturday at 10 o'clock. So all of our helpers come to that. Put that on your calendar. A couple of last things we got, again, or one more reminder this week, the, this quarter's Reflecting God, which is just a great resource and devotional option for you. Right back there at Connection Point, you can grab one on your way out. Um, got small ones, and we got a couple of large print ones if you're like me and you need a little help. The last thing is, and Cindy, our, our Connection Point leader, she's going to be back at Connection Point after church. And for those of you that go to church here and you've been going to church here, you're a member or a regular attender, we've, we've been working a long time on trying to show you the places where you can serve. Trying to, we're trying to be more transparent because I know in a small church especially, you don't want to step on anyone's toes and you're not sure where you can plug in or where you can serve. And so what we've do, done is... We've, we've come up with our Step 2.5 booklet that is Pathways to Service. And we just want to say that there's a place for all of you to serve here at Harbor, and there always will be. And so in this, Cindy will give this to you, one per household. It'll give you a chance to look through this and see there are lots of places that you can serve in the church. And it doesn't mean that it's going to take your whole life, but there's room for you at the table. And we want to make sure that you know all the ways. And in there, just like our Step 1, 2, and 3 books, if you're interested in one, you can make a check mark there and who you're going to talk to and reach out to that person and we will get you plugged in. So on the way out, see Cindy. She'll get you one of these. Take it home and look it over and pray about it. Where does God want you to serve in your church? And make no mistake, we'll make room no matter what is happening. All right, I think, uh, I think I'm good. Am I good? All the announcements? Hey, all right. Well, we're going to be in Matthew 26 today. Matthew 26, 36 to 39. And, and, and I, I'm good. I, I actually love the Palm background. It is Palm Sunday, but it's also, and for us today, it's Passion Sunday. Um, so we're going to be spending a lot of time today, and, and trust me, you should be grateful for verses. I had a lot to read. I had to figure out where to trim it down. So we're going to talk about a lot. We're going to read less. I do want to say, again, as we get into this sermon, I'm not, I'm not dressing it up today. 
There's some sermons that just need to be what they are. And that's today is one of those days. And so it's going to be simple today, but I think it's going to say the right things. It's also the shortest sermon I've had in a long time. But as you're ready and preparing your hearts, let's, let's pray and ask God to center us. And let's be quiet for a moment and just take it in. God, we are here in your presence with your people, grateful for your presence in the singing and the scripture and the offering and the prayer. God, we just pray in this moment, it's so easy to take for granted in our life situation, God, that you would impress upon our hearts your word today, that you'd have your way in our heart or mind and soul, that you would begin to shape us to, to model our lives after you. And God, most of all this morning, help us to remember. Help us to remember. It's in the name of Christ we pray all these things. Amen. 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 All right, Matthew 26, 36, 39. We'll get there in just a moment. I have a question for you this morning. What's your limit? You laugh because I don't even need to ask that. What's your limit? What's, what's the point where if a line gets crossed, you say, enough is enough? Enough is enough. Where, where's that limit for you? Maybe there's a specific situation that, that you would never allow a line to be crossed, but, but when, when's, when's something that could happen to you that would make you say that? I'm done. Enough is enough. And how, how do you normally react when you've hit that limit? Trust. Huh? Distrust. Distr- Dale says distrust. Break his trust, that's the enough is walk enough. Away. You walk away. So that's, how, that's the enough is enough. Dale's done. He just walks away. If he can't trust you, walks away. Okay? Thank you. What about you? Oh, come on. I know you're more cranky than this. Amber? Oh, your limit's lowered since you get older. I, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like the wick's getting a little shorter. Yeah, what happens when you reach your limit? The mom voice comes out. Ah, yeah, it's, yeah. I get that. I get that. Okay. What about you? Mine's similar to Dale. It, for me, it's lying. Lying? If I know you're lying, I'm done. Okay. And all, your, all, all the kids back there know. They're, I'm like, what's the one they missed at the college? Lying. Okay. Lying. Okay. So you lie, it's over. And you're just done at that point. That's how you kind of, that's the enough is enough. I'm not dealing with this. Okay. Anybody else? You guys are so, you're such good children. Okay, so for Carrie, it's when someone else is going to get hurt, the line, it's like, that's over. Stop it, right? Okay, so how do you react, though? Whether it's physical or emotional, like if it's teasing or, you know, things like that. If, if it's to that point where someone's going to get hurt, either physically or emotionally, it's, I'm done. Um, what does I'm done mean? Yeah, just get just get angry. Okay, okay. Any final thoughts? Yeah, so Becky says if 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 it's someone doing something intentionally to agitate or get under your skin, she com- she confronts it. And then that's it. Okay. Now for me, if it's family, then I would, you know, my kids would say, I, you know, you get angry, break my voice. But anybody else, like at work, if someone is doing something, I turn quiet. Okay. So sometimes your circumstance determines. Yeah. So you can get angry at home, at work, you seclude, yep. get really quiet. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, if I were to, for me, I, there's only so many times I will ask for something to get done. I don't, I don't like feeling placated, you know, you know what I mean by that? Like, I'm just going to say yes to get you off my back and then nothing gets done. And then, and then I'm like, okay, I'm going to ask again. 
and then it doesn't get done, and then I'm like, okay, I'm going to ask again, but there's a line. And for me, when I have to ask so many times, and you can ask my kiddos this or carry this, I, like it stops at a point. I stop asking. And typically how I respond is, and, and there's some bitterness in this, is I just do it. It's just like my limit is, okay, okay, I'm not going to ask anymore. I'm going to get it done though. So that's kind of how I respond. I'm kind of a jerk like that, but that's, that's, how, that's how I am. There's a limit. I'm not going to ask too many times. If you say you're going to do it, do it. If not, then I'm going to move on kind of a thing. I, you know, I don't feel alone in that, and even as you have mentioned, uh, I think that's natural in all of us, isn't it? It's, it's very natural for us to have limits. We all have limits. And there's only so much that we can take. Right? Like, there's a, there's a ceiling for things. And, and when the line is crossed, we actually have very little restraint in our response. Right? It's like, it's like they hit the volcano top and, the, you know, boom, the mom voice comes out. Or the louder the mom voice comes out. Or, you know, you walk away. And there's very little restraint. And we're taught not to have very much restraint in, in our society today. When, when people cross the line... You're allowed to just go ballistic or respond however you want to respond. And, and it is kind of what it is. And, and in fact, I would say what I've kind of noticed over the, the, the years in our modern society, we play out scenarios in our heads that have never happened to us personally as we mentally prepare for how we would respond or how the world thinks we should respond to a given situation. So we've kind of transitioned where it's not even about what happens to me, but when I see things, maybe I start to think, well, if, if, this, if this happens to me, that's where I'm allowed to do this. And I'm able to go up one step further in my reaction. So you can take that logically from the basement all the way up to the ceiling. But you know what I mean there? We love to play out scenarios in our heads. Here's how I'm going to respond when that happens. And I've always been sarcastic like that. Oh, let me tell you what I would do, you know, in that moment. Like cross the line. And you know what would happen most of the time? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing at all. But, you know, we do that. And I remember going, I was in Chicago walking. I hate big cities. But I was walking around Chicago on the sidewalk. And I remember, and I try to think that I'm the guy that would do the right thing. And I remember a gal running from a couple of guys just screaming for help. And, you know, they, they, you know, whatever. I don't know. But I froze. I'm not proud of it. I froze. And I was like, I don't know what to do. I just kept walking, you know, but and other people were braver than me. We're all gifted with different things. Me helping you, not one of them. <laughs> Someone's chasing you. You're on your own. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to keep walking. No, I mean, no, seriously though, like anytime I would play out a scenario in my head, it was like, you know, enough is enough. Like, Carrie, if something bad's going to happen, I'm going to play out that scenario. Here's how. I'm the tough guy that's going to respond. No. No, no, that's probably not going to happen for me. But that's kind of natural for all of us. Even if we make up scenarios, most of us know that where our line is. We know where enough is enough. And when you can say those words, you're already at the point where you're saying things that you shouldn't be saying or responding in ways that you shouldn't be responding because you, you've given yourself permission right? Cross the line. So I'm going to cut them out of my life. I'm going to move on. I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to seclude. I'm going to yell. I'm going to scream. I'm going to whatever it might be. You know me, I like to think about how we think as people and how naturally we've been taught to think, whether that's through our parents or implicitly through TV or whatever, radio, whatever it might be. And how that thinking has kind of bled its way into our lives as Christian folk. And it's really easy to be the kind of people, even as Christians, that say and have those boundaries. That you know, Boundaries are important, by the way. I'm not saying not have boundaries. But to, to find those scenarios that say, when this line's crossed, I've got permission to enough is enough. So when do I get to cross this person out of my life? Or well, this church isn't doing what I want them to do, so enough is enough, and I'm moving on. I'm going somewhere else. You know what I'm talking about. Like they play into our spiritual lives. And I've been thinking this week, it's Passion Week. It's Palm Sunday, yes, but it's Passion Week. And I've been thinking, like, well, 
What about God in all of that? How how does God respond when the lines cross? And what might that mean for you and me? I'm thinking of the passion. um, Most of our minds are going to go to one thing, but I want to make a case today that, well, I want us to play around with, when, when will Jesus say, enough is enough? Enough is enough. Let's read our text. 36, 39, chapter 26. I'm on the NRSV. Words will be on the screen. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. And then he said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. Going a little further, he threw himself on the ground and he prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. These are the words of God for the people of God. You can say it with me. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. I'm going to be brief today. Simple sermon. Our story, the passion narrative, begins with this story. A prayer in a garden. Jesus pouring out His soul. And in other Gospel accounts, it's it's really intense, this prayer in the garden. He's so filled with grief and agony, and you've been there maybe in your life. He's so filled with grief that As he's praying in other gospel accounts, tears of blood are streaming down his cheeks. He's that grieved and praying that hard and pouring himself that much. He pleaded with the Father, there's any other way. There's any other way. Can we do that? But I'll do what you want. I got to thinking, like, why would Jesus be upset to this level? And naturally, I think when we think the passion narrative or the passion of the Christ, as the movie would say, I think our minds go to his death, right? Like, okay, he, he's grieving and even to death because he knew that his time had come, that he was going to die, and, and he was going to die violently, and that's what, that's what Jesus knew. So that must be why, because that's where we centered our attention when we think of the passion narrative, the violence, the pain, torture, and death. Hence, we have the Passion of the Christ movie, right? Like three hours of torture is what you kind of see. And I'm not going to knock on that today. It's just that's what we're fascinated with is the torture and the gore. But as I think of the entirety of the Passion narrative, it actually runs from verse 36 all the way through chapter 27. It's a lot of verses and a lot of stories. Every step that occurred from this point, from the garden to the grave, seems to be just as traumatic as the violence. So yeah, I mean, yes, Jesus knew it was His hour, as John would say. Jesus knew that it was His time to die. But Jesus also knew that far more was going to happen to Him that might be even worse than death on a cross. That's weird to say. Yet, oftentimes, these stories, though we, we read them and we remember them, they're often glossed over because we're so overly focused on the gore and the violence. And interestingly, just so you know, for your Bible study experts, the Gospels don't actually talk a lot about the gore. In fact, it it takes up far less room than anything else, which you'll see today. Uh, It was kind of assumed they would know, but they didn't center, they didn't didn't care about centering on the gore. And so that makes me think they must be pointing to something different as well. If Matthew doesn't focus on the violence, then, then what is he pointing to? And so what was Jesus about to endure? that made him so grieved as he was. 
that made him so upset that he poured himself out, blood running down his cheeks. What made him that upset? If it wasn't just violence. So let's, let's take it chunk by chunk. So I want you to hear, and we're going to go through the whole passion narrative today. I won't read the scripture, we'll break it down. But hear what Jesus endured from, gray, from garden to grave. Get to verses 36 to 46, and you read some of it today, but down to 46, and encounter sleeping disciples. He came back from praying. He's pouring out his soul. He is filled with agony. And, and these men that are supposed to be dependable and, and, and engaged and listening to him and learning from him, here they are sleeping, disengaged, apathetic, no care in the world, not ready for what was to come. I, I would say that word apathy is good for me and, and disconnect. Think about it. The ones who are supposed to be the rocks. The ones who are supposed to be the foundation for everything that was to come. I mean, they followed Jesus around forever. In his absence, Jesus is gone. What do they do? Nothing. Just take a nap. And then you get to verses 47 to 55, and there's the betrayal. One of his closest friends. Now listen, Judas was a disciple. He's one of the close 12, Right? This is someone over three plus years that Jesus has built a strong relationship with. Someone that he knew and was closer to him than 99.99% of the world. Sells him out with a kiss. All because Jesus did not do what Judas wanted Jesus to do. Someone he loved and trusted, stabbing him in the back. Talk about enough is enough. And then in verse 56, you see the desertion. All these disciples said, we will go with you wherever you go. We'll never leave you. All of a sudden, full of fear, they run. They scatter like ants off an anthill, hiding. Turns out they didn't really want to go where Jesus was going to go. And so in this very moment, He's alone. Alone. And then you get to verses 57 to 68, and he's convicted and he's mocked by his leaders. The men who should have known him. The men who should have supported him and encouraged him and loved on him. Instead, they tore him apart and they sentenced him to death. And think about it this way. It's like, it's like your pastor People, the person you look up to for guidance and love and encouragement, your pastor throws you under the bus. That's what's going on. And then you get to 69 to 75, and there's the denial. Peter, one of his closest friends, the one who said, you're the Messiah. The one who declared that. In the face of pressure and in the face of a hostile crowd, he said, I don't know who this man is. I've never seen him before in my whole life. Think about this. Jesus was going to die for a friend that was not willing to die for him. And then he's traded for a criminal. In chapter 27, 11 to 26, you've heard of his name, Barabbas. Listen to this. Think about this. It's Palm Sunday. This is really important. The very people that Jesus healed, the very people he fed, the ones he taught, he included, he forgave, and he loved, the very people who just the day before were ushering him into Jerusalem, Hosanna, Hosanna, save now, save now, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. His own people, his people, the, the nation of Israel, Stirred up in a frenzied rally, and I think that's important for us to remember in days like today. Stirred up in a frenzied rally. Give us the bad guy. Give us what we want. Crucify him. The very people he fed and healed and taught and forgave. His, 
his people, like his family. And then he's dismissed by the powers of the world. And that's just 27, 24. Pilate washes his hands. He's not my problem. His blood's not on my hands. You do with him what you want. Think about it this way. Even the Gentiles, the ones that Jesus knew he was going to save, even those people, the whole world, even they don't care about him. Just, they're going to move on to their normal lives, wash their hands. Eh, not a big deal. Not a big deal. And then comes the violence. Five verses. We've gone through a lot more verses. Five verses where he's flogged, he's beaten, thorns are impressed in the skin on his head, he is spit on, he is mocked, he is hit with a rod. The world beat him down to show him how weak he was. And then, 27, 31 to 38, he's crucified. Think about this. It wasn't simply enough to kill Jesus. Instead, he was given what would be the worst and was considered a cursed death. He would be nailed to and hanging from wood naked. Naked for all to see. I know we put clothes on him in the pictures, but listen, that, that does not do justice to what happened on that day. Exposed for the whole world to see. Hanging up there until he would get so weak that he would suffocate by his own shoulders. Hours and hours of agony. Then he's taunted. He's hanging up there. He's got this sign above his head that says King of the Jews. That's his charge, right? And here he's watching these soldiers. They've got his clothes and they're, they're gambling for them. He's watching the world say, our stuff is more important than your life. And then his people, again, coming around while he's bleeding out and dying, saying, oh, if you, you know, oh, he's crying out. Oh, if you just cry out to the angels, they, save yourself and we'll believe you. Come on down. We'll believe who you say you are. And then he died. And then he died. Screams. My God, my God, he sings a hymn. I've always said, I think he sings there even when he's screaming. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he... And that was it. Down to the pit. Down to the separation from God. Down to the bottom of hell. Indeed, like that language or not, that is where Jesus went. Can't break the gates from the outside. This is the passion narrative. In its totality, this is what Jesus endured. And when you put it this way, there's a whole lot more there than violence. A whole lot more there that would make it hard for Jesus to keep going. To keep one foot in front of the other, following God's will for his life. His friends betraying and abandoning him. His people trading him. The world washing their hands of them. All that emotional pain. And yes, all of that physical pain. And that leaves me with that question. When was enough enough? At what point, if we can think in our worldly way today, at what point would it have been okay in your mind for Jesus to say, I'm done? Throw his hands up in disgust. This is not worth it anymore. I'm done with these people. And then just wipe us all off the face of the earth. You know? You see, I, I think this is why Jesus was filled with so much agony and grief in the garden. 
not because of the violent pain that he was about to endure, but because I think he knew that every step from, from garden to grave, there would be the temptation for him to say, enough is enough. They're not worth it. I'm not doing this for them. And who could blame Jesus if he did? In fact, my limit's all the way at number one. Enough was enough a long time ago for me. Long time ago. But what, what was Jesus' response? Even after everything that he endured, he gave his life away. You know, in our kind of vengeful and violent church rhetoric these days, we often miss this point. Jesus' life was not taken from him. He was not murdered. He was not murdered. His life was not taken. He breathed out and gave it up. And he gave his life away. Instead, with that cry of a psalm, why? Here's what I think. I, I think Jesus endured the worst of us. You and me. So that the worst could be redeemed. So that we could see a possibility of a better life than the one that we have created for ourselves. You know, when we share with others what Jesus did for them, oftentimes we simply state this, right? He died for you. He died for your sin. And that's not wrong. I'm not, I'm not here to correct that. But that's typically where we stay, right? Like, why Jesus was grieved? He was going to die. He died for you. And that's right. But as I reflect on the whole story, I think it's more than that. Yes, it culminates in Jesus giving up his life, but what Jesus did for you was far more than die. He suffered disappointment and betrayal, abandonment and denial. He suffered their belittling and their mockery. He suffered the beatings. He suffered the stuff of life being more important than life and his life especially. Jesus endured the worst of us. He endured everything that you have been put through. And let me say it this way. He, he endured everything that you have put him through. So when Paul says, there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God in Jesus Christ, Paul really means it. Why? Because he knows. How does he know? Well, because despite everything that Jesus had to endure, instead of saying enough is enough, he said, Father, forgive them. So for Paul, he's in Romans, he's like, man, I'm convinced. There's nothing that can separate you from God's love. He really believes it. I told you it was brief. Today. Sometimes I say that and we still got 25 minutes to go. Listen, there is no reason for me to make this sermon fancy. You don't need any more stories. You don't need examples from my life. What am I going to add to that? Passion Sunday is anything but fancy. And sometimes I think, you know, we've been talking about slow down for a while, you know, through the Lent season, slow down. Sometimes I think as we just get carried away in life and we move and we move and we move, sometimes we just need a reminder. Just a reminder of why we chose to follow Jesus. Or maybe why we should follow Jesus. Because of the way that He chose us. 
You see, the same way that Jesus did not give up on his disciples, he did not give up on his people, he did not even give up on those nasty Gentile Romans, he never gave up on you. He never gave up on you. Even the worst of you. I think about him. How wonderful is love like this? That despite everything that you and I deserve, literally, enough should have been enough a long time ago. Don't you think? Like if you really think back on your life, when you say, man, enough should have been enough a long time ago for me. He chose you and He keeps choosing you. Never giving up on you. And that means that you and I are being invited to follow Him to a better life. Listen, let me tell you something right now. I know, I know what you think the good life is. I'm going to channel Mike Yule today. I know what you think happiness is. I know what you think enough is. And I know that you carry your hurts and your scars and the wounds of life and all of those things. And knowing what we know about Jesus and everything that he overcame and he endured to the point of death, even death on a cross, as Philippians would say. You and I are invited to a better one, a life that's better than resentment. There's a better life than anger and bitterness. There's a life that is better than pride and success and wealth and power. And I know everyone wants you to chase those things. Let me tell you, there's a better life than all of that crap. There's a life that's better than sorrow and fear and vengeance. There's a life that is better than shame and regret. You are invited on Passion Sunday and Easter Sunday and every single Sunday, you are invited to live a life marked by grace and mercy and forgiveness. You are invited to live a life of simplicity and contentment. You are invited to live a life of peace in community for you and for each other. So here's the truth. Hear it. There's nothing that you have ever done in your whole life that's not already been done to him. And there is nothing that you are going through that he has not already overcome. So when you feel like you are too far gone, or when you feel like you are not good enough or don't have enough to offer, so when you feel like you've done too much or feel like giving up, you have to know that he has not given up on you. There really is nothing that can separate you from the love of God in Jesus Christ. So it's just a reminder. Nothing special or fancy. Sometimes we just need to be reminded. Jesus died for you. But so much more than die. He endured the worst of you so that you could live. So, how are you living? How are you living? Carrying the enough's enough, chasing success or wealth, or or Jesus. How are you living? I'm not going to beleaguer the point. I think you get it. Jesus died for you. 
but so much more than diving. You're always welcome to come and pray. Maybe today you needed a reminder of why you chose Jesus. And let me tell you, if you haven't, I hope you've learned why you should. What else could you ever want in life than to experience the complete opposite of what Jesus endured on his way to the cross? Easter's coming. Resurrection makes sense only because of today. It's a good week. Will you pray with me? God, it's, it's really easy to get kind of going. Easter comes around, Good Friday, Palm Sunday, they come around once a year. And most of the time we're looking for good series and good inspiration and practical tools to live our lives. God, it's sometimes so easy to just get moving as if Easter is just contained here. Good Friday is just a moment to celebrate or remember. God, we forget this is what we build our whole life around. God, this morning as we recall everything that you endured, the worst that humanity has to offer, the worst that we've given you, we have to stop and say thank you for never giving up on me when you should have. And it would have been way easier than dealing with me going up and down. for sticking with me when I chose other things, sometimes still do. That your love for me is not in your death, it's in your constant enduring grace and loving kindness and your faithfulness. God, we know that it took your death to unite us with you and you gave your life up so we could live. And so God, today I just pray that for every person online and those who are in this sanctuary, God, that you would teach us what it means to really live. God, that you would, with power, by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would help us to see the things that are most valuable. To keep our eyes focused on you and not anything else. And God, if for any of those things in our lives that are keeping us from drawing closer to you, whether that's our own sin or our difficulties, God, just um, God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, begin a work in us that would make us holy, that would draw us out of the miry clay, shape us in your image. But thank you, Jesus. You rescued me. And thank you, Jesus, you set me free. And I didn't deserve it. And you were kind of reckless. But thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. God, this morning we stopped to pray for those who are sick. For those who are nearing their end, for Jack and for Brandy. God, I just pray that you would cover them in your presence. That they would know that you're there, even if they don't believe it yet. You would make yourself visible and felt and known. Be with their family. God, bring them comfort and strength. And God, this morning we pray for our brother Greg. We know, God, that he, this is taking it out of him. And so, God, just please fill him with your strength today. 
God, keep his countenance high. He might find joy in your presence today. Be with his family as they love him and journey with him on this road he's been on. For those in our church who have been grieving for the loss of loved ones, draw near to them as well. Indeed, in all these things, we recognize that what you overcame are the very things that scare us most. No matter what we face in life, you've promised that it doesn't have to be the end. And so, God, we put our trust in you and the hope of the resurrection. Not that we've already obtained it, but we're going to press on. Thank you, Jesus. We pray all these things in the wonderful, matchless name of your Son, your life, Emmanuel. Amen and amen.